of Jesus, and those are the parables of Jesus. And we've looked at a few of them already. And to begin with this particular one, I wanted to just mention the fact that we got an expression, we're just dust in the wind. Well, the Bible has an expression that we are just dust of the ground. And uh, if we'll go to the next part of the slide, it says, For the Lord God formed the man from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living being. And that kind of goes with the verse that we are doing for, for the month. From one man, okay, God made all nations of men. God breathed into this dust of the ground the breath of life, and man became a living being. Uh, when we go to the third chapter, we find that man sinned against God. And as a consequence of his sin, and because God said, the day that you eat of the forbidden fruit, the day you eat thereof, you shall surely die. God gives a, a curse upon him and pronouncement upon him. Dust you are, and to dust you will return. We are just dust. We're just dust. In fact, Jesus is going to build a sermon on this. The fact that we are just dust, we are just dirt, we're just soil. And from dust, you know, God created us, and to dust we will return. And it says in Matthew 13, in the, the, the story or the parable about the four soils, uh, some call it the sower and the seed, that it says that same day. Now, in order to look at that same day, you've got to back up to chapter before and the chapter before. Uh, Jesus had to perform some miracles, and they were attributing Jesus' miraculous powers to Beelzebub, a name for Satan. They were saying that Jesus was doing this by the power of Satan, so he's getting fierce opposition okay, to his ministry. And on that same day, others were coming to him and saying, come on, if you're, if you're who you say you are, perform a miracle for us. And uh, so he's getting two. If you, if you do something, you know, you're darned if you do and you're darned if you don't. That's where he's at. You know, he does miracles. They're saying he's from the devil. Uh, now he's saying do miracles. And he's saying, you, you adulterous generation, you wicked people. All you want is a sign. And, and then he, he goes into the house and he's in the house and, and there he's teaching and, and uh, Mary and his brothers and sisters, they come to him and they want to talk to Jesus. And Jesus says, but who is my brother, who is my sister, but these who do the will of God. Family is more than just who was in your house when you were born. In God's family, it's those who do the will of God, who do the will of God. That same day, Jesus went out of the house. See, he'd been in the house teaching the disciples. And he sat by the lake, and such a large crowd gathered around him. He's in his, what I call the climactic Galilean ministry. He's at the peak. Masses are coming to him. He's popular. But, but at the same time, while he's popular among the people, the elites of the day do not like him. Kind of like politics today. <laughs> Nothing's changed. All right? The elites don't like, and the, the, the people do, and people vote, and the, the elites try to influence the vote. So the elites... You know, they, they've turned on Jesus. They, they want to, they're trying to kill him. But the people, the masses, they've come to Jesus. There's such a large crowd that he gets in a boat and, and he just backs off a little bit offshore there, you know? So the people will only go to the shoreline as they're pressing towards him. And, and he taught, and here it is, it's about the soil. He said, and then he told them many things in parables. Many, he told these many stories that are, the word parable means para alongside of, balo to throw. He throws the story alongside of a truth. Now the difficulty here is he's telling the story, but he hasn't given them the truth he's trying to illustrate. So he's giving them the illustration, but he's not telling them what it illustrates. Very interesting. This is what he said. He starts off with this, this sermon. He says, a farmer went out to sow a seed. Most of us here aren't farmers. We've never farmed, okay? And so, and even if we had, we'd probably use a modern technique of sowing the seed, okay? But in, in the ancient world, they turn over the soil, and then they would take, and they would scatter seed. They would sow. They would just throw it. And the seed, and that's what I got here, the farmer. He's just throwing out the seed. And Jesus told him a story. There was a farmer that went out, and he was sowing a seed. And he says, as he was scattering the seed, he couldn't help it, but some fell on the path. Now, the path would have been you know, the hardened ground where they had traveled back and forth. I don't know if you've ever had a path at your house. I bought my boys a mini bike, but they weren't old enough to ride the street. So my boys would ride it around the house. It didn't take many days until there was no grass growing where the mini bike rode. 
They had just tore up all the grass. It was a dirt path because nothing grows on the path. It was like, it got as hard as concrete. I mean, it got as hard as concrete. And so if I had thrown some seed on that, it would have just been trampled and it would have been, it, it would take. And that's what he says. As he was scattering some seed, some fell along the path. And then he adds this, and the birds came and ate it up. It didn't even have a chance to get into the ground. It was on hard ground, so it didn't get into the ground. And then the birds, that was easy picking. I don't know if you've ever tried to, you know, to uh, grow some grass and you throw the seed out and the birds come and they have a field day unless you put something on top of it. You know, you got to cover it up even if you got good soil. Here it's on the path. There's no good soil. Birds come and they're, they're eating up all the seed. I call that the hard soil. The next one is a rocky soil. He said, some fell on rocky places. Now the rocky places, he says, where it did not have much soil. There's a little soil there, but not much. And it sprang up quickly because the soil was shallow. It was shallow. Remember that word, it's shallow. It, it takes root, it ger germinates a little bit, and it begins to grow. And then, but when the sun came up, the plants were scorched and they withered because they had no root. Two things going on here. The sun is scorching, so it's hot. There's no rain. There's no water. They're dehydrating, and they don't have root. They have, because there's no, they, they can't go down deep enough to get the nourishment they need from the soil, the water that's in the soil, way below the dry, arid, sun-beaten surface of, of the earth. And so it says here, they, they have no root. These plants are dying. They're dying. He goes on, he said, now as the sower was sowing, some fell on the path, some fell among the rocks. He said, another, it fell among the thorns. Today we would say it fell among the weeds. You know, that's why I like to keep my grass mowed all summer long, because when it's mowed, you can't tell the difference between the weeds and the grass, because it's all green. But, it, it, you know, after a day or two after it's been mowed, those wicked weeds, they come up and they choke out all the good grass. It seems like the weeds grow and the grass dies. It's exactly what he's talking about here. The seed fell among the thorns, which grew up and it choked the plant. It choked the plant. So, finally he says, sower was sowing some, he says, and still other seed fell on good soil. Good soil. And the good soil said when it produced a crop, it was 160 or 30 times what was sown. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. This is the sermon Jesus gives. It's a parable to illustrate a point. He hasn't given the point. If you would have been there, and you would have been with him, you would have said, just like disciples, oh, great story, Jesus, but why are you telling stories? Everybody said, what's the point? What, what do you want? No, no, so he says, the disciples came to him and asked him, why do you speak to the people in parables? He said, well, we don't get it. Do you want us to become farmers? Is that the point of the story? Uh, do you want us to, to sow seed? Should we be going out and buying seed so we can grow food, so we can distribute to the poor and the needy? What's the point of the story, Jesus? Uh, should we be better environmentalists because you know, we're supposed to rule over the earth? What's the point of the story, Jesus? You see, if that's all you had, what would you be thinking? What's this all about, Jesus? And Jesus gives the answer. Why, this, why, why give this story? He replied, the knowledge of the secrets of the kingdom of heaven have been given to you. It is to reveal. He is revealing truth in this parable. And at the very same time, he says, but not to them. He is both revealing the truth and he's concealing the truth. He wants those who are believers to know, but those who have been accusing him of blaspheming the Holy Spirit, that wicked, adulterous generation, for them to, it doesn't make sense. Did you ever notice that people who don't know Jesus as their Savior when they read their Bible, that doesn't make sense to them? Did you ever notice that? But the people who know Jesus as their Savior, when they read the Bible, they hear God speak to them. Did you ever notice that? On the one hand, it reveals God, and on the other hand, it's concealed. They don't get it. They don't get it. They don't get it. And that's exactly what he's saying here. He says, 
Whoever has will be given more, and he will have an abundance. The good soil is going to have, it's going to take root, it's going to grow, and it's going to produce all kinds of crops. There's going to be abundance. But that which falls on the hard pavement, there is no return. It doesn't grow. It doesn't grow. This is why I speak in parables. Though seeing, the Pharisees saw the miracles, the Pharisees saw the healings, you know, the scribes and all the rest. Though seeing and though hearing, they heard what he was saying, what Jesus was preaching. They do not hear or understand. They just don't get it. You do, and I find that all the time. We find people that just don't get it. He goes on to say, In them is fulfilled the prophecy of Isaiah. It was predicted in the Old Testament. When it comes to Good Friday, we're going to have a Good Friday service here, and we're going to talk about one of the predictions of the Old Testament that Good Friday had to happen to fulfill Scripture. This is in line with that. This had to happen. He says, Isaiah the prophet prophesied, you will be ever hearing but never understanding. You'll be ever seeing but never perceiving. It is to fulfill prophecy. To fulfill prophecy. He says, for this people's heart has become callous. This is crucial. This is the key. This is the heart to the, this is the point he's wanting to make in the whole parable. It has to do with the heart. It has to do with the heart. These people's heart is callous. They hardly hear with their ears and they have closed their eyes. See, they're deliberately closing their eyes or covering their ears. They don't want the truth. He said, otherwise, if they didn't do that, their eyes would be open, their ears would hear, and they would understand with their hearts, and they would turn, and I would heal them because they'd repent. If you repent, if you listen to the Word of God, and if you receive the Word of God, it will change your life. It will change your life. He said, but blessed are you, he says to the disciples, blessed are you. Blessed are your eyes because they see, and your ears because they hear. He says, for I tell you, the truth. Many prophets and, right, and righteous men long to see what you see, but did not see it and hear what you hear, but did not hear it. People often say to me, well, the parables, why don't you talk about parables so they're easy to understand, simple truths. No, not necessarily. Those that are about the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God, are very complicated because he, all, he doesn't always tell you the point. In fact, I read commentators that argue over what is the point because some of them we just don't know. Jesus didn't tell us what the point was. Here he told them that so that the crowd heard it and now the disciples, he says, okay, what does it mean? He says, listen. Listen then to what the parable of the sower means. The seed is the message. The seed that the sower is sowing is the message. It's the message about the kingdom. The kingdom is the king. We just prayed for it. Did you catch that in the Lord's Prayer? Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done. It's the message about God's kingdom, God's will being done here on earth. And when a preacher preaches, whether it was Jesus preaching, he was sowing the seed. Whether it was the Apostle Paul preaching, he was sowing the seed. Whether it's the Pastor Dennis preaching... (laughs) He's sowing the seed. You know, when you're at work and they call you the preacher because you quote a Bible verse, you're sowing the seed. You're sowing the seed. The seed is the message. So then, the sower is the messenger. The person who hears the message. Somebody had to deliver that message. We are the messengers. The sower is the messenger. The soil is the masses. They're the people. The people where they're the ones hearing, receiving through the ear gate, the word of God that we're delivering as messengers, this is what Jesus is talking about. This is the point. The word of God is the seed that makes the people the soil, and the people is the focal point of the whole story. This parable is famous because it's the parable of the sower and the seed, and I think that's mistitled. It's the parable about the four soils, four kinds of people. That's what it's about. Watch what he says. 
When anyone hears the message about the kingdom and does not understand it, the evil one comes. Remember the birds came down on the path, they picked up the, the, the seed and they took it away from the person and they snatch it away. The evil one, referring to Satan, the devil, he snatches away that which was sown in the heart. So God, the, the message comes and it comes to the person. It's to strike them at their very heart because their hearts were calloused. It was hard. It landed on a calloused heart. And the devil comes and snatches it away so that they don't believe. The apostle Paul put it this way. The God of this age has blinded the eyes of them lest they would believe the gospel and be saved. Satan does not want people to come to know Jesus. It's that simple. It's that simple. The hardened soil is the hard heart that is against Jesus. The next one is the rocky soil. Remember I said, remember that word shallow? It's the shallow heart. The one who received the seed that fell on the rocky place is the man who hears the word, and it's on shallow ground, and at once he receives it with great joy. It's an emotional experience. He's so happy and he's just all joyous about Jesus. And man, things are just so wonderful. And then he says, since he has no root, he hasn't got past his heart to his head. There's no substance to his faith. He's not rooted and grounded. When a trouble or a persecution comes the first time at work, somebody challenges him about his faith or someone gives him a hard time or perhaps passes him for a promotion, he says, well, maybe this is not such a good thing. He's following Jesus. He, because of the word of God, he quickly falls away. There was no real depth in him to the word of God. <clears throat> the next one that Jesus talked about, he said, listen, the thorny soil, soil the one who receives the seed that fell on, among the thorns or the weeds is the man who hears the word but he worries, but the worries of this life and the deceitfulness of wealth choke it out and make him unfruitful. We talked about this last week. The man that, uh, the parable of the man, uh, uh, the rich fool, and, and he had all this blessing from God and he said, oh, I got so much, I'll take my ease, eat, drink, and be merry because I'm going to build great barns, I'm going to do this, I, I, I. And, and, then, uh, and then God said, you fool, Whose will all these things be? Because your soul is required of you tonight. Remember that? And then immediately following that in that passage, it talked about worry. Why do you worry about the stuff of this world? And so the worries and wealth go hand in hand. It chokes out your faith. When I am so caught up in my stuff, it crowds out the word of God in my life. I should be pursuing the Word of God and allowing it to work in my life. We get so worried about our stuff, we insure it. Just in case I should lose it, then I got it insured that I can keep it. I'll replace it. And he's saying, what is your life? He said, it's more than the stuff you had. We saw that last week. The worries and the wealth, it chokes out your fruitfulness. Then he says, ah, the good soil, the productive. It's a productive heart. But the one who receives the seed that fell on the good soil is the man who hears the word of God and understands it. He produces a crop yielding 160, 30 times what was sown. It produces a crop. It produces a crop. So what is the crop? I clicked that twice. What is the crop? What is the crop that it produces in my life? Well, I think, first of all, it produces a new life. It produces a new life. For you have been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable, how? Through the living and enduring word of God. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. No one has ever come to faith in Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior who hasn't heard the word. The word came, it was received. As many as welcomed it, received it, to them he gave the power to become the children of God, to them who believed in his name. Someone proclaims the truth, I believe the truth, I'm born of the Spirit of God. He says, I get a whole new life. Just to refresh our memory from last month's memory verse, quote this with me, all right? Can you say this? Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, 
He is a new creation. The old has gone, the new has come. That's the crop. God is in the business of changing our lives. When I see change taking place in my life, I know that the Word of God is active. It's working in my life. I know that I'm one of those who've been born again. This is the fruit. This is the crop. This is what the Word of God is producing in my life. There's the crop of an assured life. Listen to this. Apostle John says, I wrote these things to you. The Word of God, I wrote it to you who believe in the name of the Son of God so that you may know that you have eternal life. I don't have to say, oh, often I'll I'll say to somebody, I'll say, do you know for sure if you died right now, if you go to be with God forever? And they'll say, "Um, I don't know. Um, I think so. Or I hope so. And then I quote this verse. You know what? These things are written that you might know. Not think so, hope so, wish so, but that you might have a confident assurance in your heart that you know that you have eternal life. You know where that comes from? The Word of God. Titus 1, 2, in hope of eternal life, which God promised before the world began and cannot lie. He said it. It goes like this, really. Jesus did it. He said it. I believe it. That settles it. I said That settles it. That settles it. It leads to a free life. He says, then you will know the truth. The word of God, it's coming to you. You've received it. You know the truth, and the truth will set you free. It is what frees you from your past. It is what frees you from your guilt. It's what frees you from, it gives you freedom. He goes on and says, there's a crop in your life, and it's a crop of a pure life. How can a young man keep his way pure by living according to your word? When I live according to the Bible and the Bible precepts, I develop a pure life I don't try to it just happens God the Holy Spirit uses his word in my life to purify me he takes things that are evil out of my life and he puts things that are blessed in my life it comes from the word of God listen there's a there's a a, the whole holy life sanctify them through your truth your word is truth The Word of God sets me apart from everyone else. That's what makes me really different. The Word of God, my time with Jesus, spend it with the Word of God. That's what sets me apart from everyone else. There is so much more of a crop. The crop continues. I can talk about the peace of God. I can talk about forgiveness. That's part of the crop. Prayer, I start praying. Faith, I start with little faith and it creates bigger faith. When God does other things, I say, I can trust God for something bigger. It's selflessness. I I sacrifice myself and live for Jesus. There's generosity. I become very generous and I share what I have. There's the crop of kindness, compassion, love. It's the spirit-filled life. When the word of God takes root in your heart, it produces a great crop. It produces a great crop. So I have to ask, this is about four kinds of soils. What kind of soil are you? You the hard soil? Hard heart? Uh, are, are you the, the shallow, stony soil? It came up in a quick hurry, but my enthusiasm has kind of died. I'm not as enthusiastic as I used to be. Are, 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 are you then... Um, The one that you worry about the things of this life. This life is actually choking out your faith. I'm more concerned about being politically correct than I am being biblical. Are you the good soil? It's not so important to me this morning what kind you are. My question really is what kind do you want to be? What kind of soil do you want to become? Because there's a certain sense in which you get to choose the soil that you become. You get to choose. Am I going to have a hard heart? Am I going to have a shallow heart? Am I going to have a worldly, worried heart? Or am I going to have a good heart? The way to be a good-hearted person, you just got to spend some time in this book and let it go down into your heart. You know, I used to... One time I was reading through my Bible and I was checking it off every day. I did my Bible reading, checking it off, checking it off. 
And then I came to this verse in Ezra, the book of Ezra. It's in the Old Testament. And it said that he was not only a preacher and a teacher, but he did it. And it was that did it that just slew me in my heart. Because it wasn't about just checking it off that I'd read it. Was I doing it, doing it? So I slowed down. And I said, rather than race through my Bible, I will read until God speaks to my heart. So one day I'd read a whole book, the whole book of Genesis, get to chapter 50. <sighs> That's a lot of reading. Okay? 50, 20. Though God meant it to me for evil, I mean, though my brothers meant it to me for evil, God meant it for good. And, and that's the verse that God spoke to my heart. Some days I'd read one verse. God speak to my heart. See, it wasn't about my checkoff list. It's about listening to God and taking it to heart. The good soil takes the word of God to heart and allows it to produce. All those things, peace, joy, love, goodness, kindness, all that stuff, he produces it in your life. What kind of soil do you want to be? Let's pray. Father in heaven, I'm convinced that everyone in this room desires to be the good soil. The good soil. To leave the worries behind, to not have Satan snatching anything out of their lives. And, but Lord, to be producing and productive for you and benefiting from all that you will produce in us. And Lord, that takes us uh, spending some time in your word, listening to you speak to us, to memorize your word, to act upon your word so that we might be productive in our lives. So I ask, Lord, for those who are here today who are listening to this message that you would grant them the ability to give them a good heart, a good soil, to receive the word, to build their lives upon it. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.